if you really feel good about the team that you're you're in the battle with because you're going to be in battles you're going to go through hard times you're going to have some hits uh and to have that team around you that you feel incredible about i mean i i had a, a team with my freight company we had 150 people but there was a good 15 or 20 people that were my friends that were i mean i might have been their boss but they're they're friends to this day and we went through all kinds of stuff with each other, but the fact that we were all in it together made it more fun to run. Hello and welcome to another episode of Better Business, Better Life. I'm your host, Deborah Chantry-Taylor, and today I am joined by another one of my U.S. colleagues, this time from New York City. Um, his name is Howard Mann, and the reason I've invited Howard on the show is that he believes um, that we have to have more fun in, in doing business, and that's a philosophy I very much share myself, and I'm really looking forward to exploring that with him. So, Howard, he's a CEO, he's a coach, he's also an U.S. implementer. Howard, welcome to the show. Great to be here. Yeah, it's great to have you here. So we've just been having a chat, as I always do before these podcasts, and getting a little bit of a, a get to know you session. Um, and you've got quite an interesting background because you've done the hard stuff. You've been a business owner and gone through the hard times. You know what it's like. And now you're working with business owners to actually help them um, through their hard times. Tell us a little about your philosophies on business and how you got to where you are today. Well, I, I, I got through it, I guess, by lessons learned the hard way. So yeah. I in the in the first half of my career, I owned part of a medium-sized freight international freight and logistics company. I always like to tell people we were travel agents for cargo. It's the best way to explain it. <laughs> um, and that business went through some hard times in the late '90s, and I spent four very lonely, stressful, worry-filled years running around the country and around the globe trying to turn the business around, and got maybe a 15 year education in four years by necessity and finally got the business to a place where we could sell it in January of 2000. But it, in those four years, uh, I, 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 the simplest way to say it is that I lost my smile. Mm -hmm. And after we sold the business and I was sort of uh, going through it in a phase of trying to figure out what was the point of all of that, I thought, well, if I could help other business owners never have to go through what I went through, then that would be, that would make those years worth it. And mm -hmm. it would be worthy work. And that started a process of writing some of the lessons that I learned, uh, what I wish I had told myself back then, giving my, my younger self advice and figuring out that, that it really wasn't all of the innovation and the fancy talk and all of these things that, that mattered, but it was getting the basics right. And one of the core basics was it doesn't, business doesn't have to be so hard. Mm. And if you can simplify the business, if you can do fewer things instead of more things, if you can just change this narrative that owning a business is supposed to be this carrying a huge boulder up a hill, and then someday you will have some incredible windfall moment or you'll sell the business or some incredible thing will happen. People waste decades believing that instead of just turning around and saying, I don't care that Instagram sold for a billion dollars after a year or whatever it is that is the incredible story of the day in, in, in business news to just say, this is my business. It needs to be fulfilling to my life mm -hmm. and it needs to do that today and if next year, in 10 years, in 20 years. And to get some clarity around, well, what, what is fulfilling? What Am I just growing for the sake of growth? Do I have a Groundhog's Day every year where I finish the year, I look at the year and say, oh, we made it through December 31st. And next year, I'm going to do the same thing all over again, but I'm going to try to do it with extra 10% on top. Mm -hmm. And that becomes incredibly unfulfilling. And Enough years go by, I always think of that story of the boiling frog, enough years go by that you just think that's what business is. It's this endless grinding through mud, then someday it's going to be fun. And I think that's broken. I think it's broken because entrepreneurs, the, the word entrepreneur has become the sort of incredible startup investing VC funded uh, that flame out famously or go to the moon. And to me, entrepreneurship is, is somebody who owns a business 
that provides a life to themselves and it provides a life to all the people that care about that business. Mm. And it supports the community. It's part of a much, much bigger um, environment, isn't it, or ecosystem? Yes, uh, I'm with you. I, I think the word entrepreneur is massively misused. And I think if you if you look at some of the, the really large kind of privately owned businesses, that's entrepreneurialism. That's where you're taking something and, and um, you know, meeting people's needs, but also supporting a, a wider community. Uh, cool. So you... Yeah, you're just, yeah sorry. sorry. You, you reminded me of there, there's this amazing organization that's called Endeavor that that you just reminded me of that, that, that it's whole premise. So it, it's, it's a fund, but it funds entrepreneur owned businesses around the world for the sole focus of if we can infuse capital into these already successful businesses, then they will hire more people and we will make an impact on the economy through those businesses around the world, as opposed to, you know, taking a flyer on a piece of software. They're, yeah. they're saying this this company already employs 300 people, but if we gave them capital, they can employ 600 or 1,000 people and make an impact in different economies around the world. That always resonated with me when I, I met somebody from that organization years ago that that's entrepreneurship to me. Yeah. Yeah, no, yeah, I'm, I'm completely on board with that as well. Like, I believe, um, I think we're on the same page in terms of I think that actually they're the ones that can really make the big difference. Uh, yep, some startups will make it and guess they'll make lots of money, but a lot of it is just just playing in my mind. <laughs> yeah. well, I, I had a conversation with a VC once. I remember as a as as in my coaching hat on, I I and and doing turnaround consulting for 20 years, that that I went to one of the VCs and I said, you know, maybe I could work with some of the companies in your portfolio that are sort of on the fence of, being, of, of failing or not failing and make them. And then you'd have, I thought this was such a genius sales idea. It turned out it was just so wrong, but, <laughs> but I, I thought that by telling them that maybe I can help and you could have more hits, you could have more mm. companies that do well. And three different ones told me, we don't care. Mm. We hope that out of the 10 companies we invest in that three are successful. If we have a 30% batting average, some of the one, one or two or three of those will give our return to our investors. And in turn, those investors will support our next fund. Yeah. And I remember hanging up the phone thinking, they're not in the business of business, no matter what the VCs say. They're not in the business of, of making sure the businesses succeed. They're in the business of returning or getting a return for their investors that they promised them so that they invest again. And maybe naive of me to think that, that they, I'm sure that there are some that really care about finding the next big thing, but mm -hmm. ultimately they're in the business of money. Mm. And, and, and the business of gambling in some respects too, right? That's all about sort of hedging your bets and making sure that you do provide the return, um, yes. but you're quite happy to go, hey, if seven fall over, so be it, as long as we get three that work and maybe one yes. that's really great, we'll be fine. Yeah. Right. And <laughs> anyway. We, and okay. and, uh, right. That's right. Yeah, we're not going to talk about that stuff because we, we really are passionate. I know you and I are both passionate about actually helping, uh, you know, strong yes. privately owned businesses get better and, and also create better lives because, you know, your whole fun to run thing, that's the bit that kind of struck with me. It's like um, business, life is too short. Business should be fun. You should be loving what you do. You should be working with people that you love. You should be um, having time to spend time with your family and the other passions that you have. And all too often business owners, they go in with all those intentions in mind and then suddenly find themselves stuck in a role that they don't particularly like. They've got people around them. They're not always um, enjoying their company and their, their entire life is consumed by business and it is no longer fun. So tell us a bit about, you You know, you've written a couple of books now. You've got the Fun to Run book. You've got the other book. Um, which, what's your better. second book? Fewer yep. Better. Fewer Better, that's right. Tell, tell us a little bit about that. <laughs> well, the, the first book was called Your Business Brickyard and the subtitle was Getting Back to Basics to Make Your Business More Fun to Run. Mm -hmm. And the idea around that was, as I mentioned earlier, is that the that I think a lot of people want to put the icing all over the cake, to use that analogy. But what matters is that the cake still has to taste good. So <laughs> I, the 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 book is a set of twelve very basic principles that, if it, and it's meant to be a very short read to just remind you of the basics that get lost along the way when you're constantly looking at other people's cool stuff and you're looking for the next shiny object, that it's the basics of business that, that are timeless, that never go out of style, right? I mean, EOS has simple, basic tools, right? It's the same thing. It's 
having a purpose that matters for your business, or as EOS calls a vision. It's mm -hmm. you know, one of the rules is get paid fast, but pay fast, but get paid faster. Mm -hmm. Another one is, is defining your business type by not what you say yes to, but what you say no to. It's, it's these simple, timeless ideas that will always work as opposed to everybody likes to focus on the shiny new branding or the website and that all of those things ultimately make you feel that you're constantly keeping up with the Joneses. And that's not fulfilling in real life. It's not going to be fulfilling in, in a business life. And the second book is, is sort of a deeper dive into what I call business life lessons, which uh, I wrote them 12 years apart. So it's, it's, Maybe a mature, more mature book about this idea that that we that we all have this sort of relentless pursuit of more. That we want more just for the sake of having more. We don't even know why we want to grow our businesses, but we know we have to grow our businesses. And it's sort of a warning to put your pride away and to just decide what is enough for you. What is enough for the kind of business that you feel good about running. Not everybody wants to run a 10,000 person business or even a thousand person business. Some people like a business. They built an agency where they really have a close knit, healthy group of 20 people and they're happy mm. and that's okay. Not everybody has to build the 5,000 person agency. And, but at the same time, you could have a 10 person or a 20 person agency, but you really do yearn for, having a 500 person agency that would make your mark. That's your dent in the universe. And so figuring out what that is and that not, and that you don't get there from just trying to do more and more of what everybody else in your industry is doing. But the idea of this mantra of fewer better, which is I'm going to do fewer things and I'm going to do them better than anybody else. And that that is the way to get more fulfillment from your business and actually to make your business unbeatable. Love the concept. Okay. So I'm really intrigued. Um, you know, you're obviously a successful business person. You turned your business around. You sold it. You've, you've been involved in many other businesses as well. Why did you choose to become an EOS implementer? Well, I, I, I've been coaching businesses for 20 years now, business owners, entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. And I felt that I, I would get them to a place where they had really a lot of clarity around what they wanted from their business, what made their business unique, the part of the business that was incredibly fulfilling for them. And I didn't feel that I had a really solid process of getting their company all lined up behind them so that they could make that vision reality. And the truth is, is that as I can talk to a, an entrepreneur and a business owner and I can help, help them to a point, mm -hmm. but if they own a business and that business is going to be responsible for what they want to accomplish in the world, they have to get their company lined up around it yeah. and they have to get everybody in the company to buy into that vision, to feel good about it. And I love that EOS is, has such a great focus on making a healthy work environment, right? You're not yes. going to, your business is never going to, as much as I'll say, I want business to be fun to run. There are days that are going to really be lousy, no matter what That's you do. Suck. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Suck is, a, is, is the right word. And and what makes that a little better is that if you really feel good about the team that you're you're in the battle with, because you're mm -hmm. going to be in battles, you're going to go through hard times, you're going to have some hits. Uh, and to have that team around you that you feel incredible about. I mean, I, I had a, a team with my freight company, we had 150 people, but there was a good 15 or 20 people that were my friends. That mm -hmm. were, I mean, I might have been their boss, but they're they're friends to this day, and we went through all kinds of stuff with each other. But the fact that we were all in it together made it more fun to run. Yeah, so and so true. EES was incredibly compelling to me because it is simple, basic tools that will never go out of style. That it isn't reliant on fancy software and all kinds of complex stuff, and it is the things that 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 most businesses don't use in order to get to where they want to get to. They, they get frustrated by hitting, I remember when I did Strategic Coach that Dan Sullivan talks about the ceiling of complexity, that every business yeah. evolves to some sort of a ceiling where they're just not structured and not capable of going to where they want to go. And, it, and then the frustration kicks in. 
And so EOS became this incredible complement to my coaching to be able to help a business owner get to that level of clarity and then say, great, now we need a way to get every single person in your company rowing in that same direction and, and in a healthy environment for you to get where you want to go. Mm. So it's a bit of a one-two punch for me. Yeah, no, I think um, it's kind of part of the reason I sort of fell in love with it too. I, I'm the same. I've actually been running business for a long time. I've been coaching for many, many, many years, but it was always with the business owner. And um, even if you did bring the team together before a team kind of strategy building day, you do all the sort of wonderful, I, I don't want to call it rara, but it felt a bit rara. We all kind of left the room going, yeah, this is really great. And then you go back into the business and of course, nothing had changed, which right. means all of that wonderful stuff that you did never got implemented. So when I saw the for the, for the first time, like the EOS proven process, I went, you mean the first day we don't get to do vision and stuff, we actually get to do you know, really practical tools. This is fantastic. I love it. Um, and so the fact that you work with a whole leadership team rather than just the owner and you really are you know, focused on sharing that vision, getting that discipline and accountability and, and working together for the greater good, I think is just, yeah, it's what sold me. And the, and, and this, and the, the focus on team health. I mm. mean, it's this idea, uh, you know, I, lo I love the line that comes up a lot in the EOS community about that, that EOS is a system for harnessing human energy because at, yes. at its core, that is a business. Yeah. It, yes, it is true. a whole bunch of people. I mean, and a lot of the things that I write and speak about are, I, I constantly make this analogy that it, it, businesses have a personality because people have a personality and businesses are made up of people. So all of the ills and the good and the bad about human beings exist in a business. People mm -hmm. like to make business be this cold machine that just runs, but ultimately it is filled with people who have good days and bad days who need to learn and grow and communicate with each other and work towards a common goal. And they have ups and they have downs and they have a personality and, Uncovering that and realizing that and not thinking that it's just this cold machine is, is a huge unlock for, for businesses to embrace. Yeah. So I'm curious, do you have a favorite EOS tool? I, I really love the, the VTO, the vision, uh, the vision Traction Organizer, because I, I think that there is, as simple as it is, right, just two pieces of paper with eight questions on them, that just the act of getting somebody to take to step out of their business for a day and work through where do they want their business to be in 10 years? Where do they want their business to be in three years, in one year? And what do you have to do in the next 90 days to be a quarter of the way to that one year? What are your core values? I, I One business after the other, maybe they had it in the beginning, but they haven't really identified what are we about? What do we care about here? How do we articulate it in a way that respects the people that are here, but also attracts incredible talent, what, what makes our business unique. And, and what happens when somebody comes away with having all of that information that was bouncing around in their head, maybe scribbled down in notebooks in 15 different places, their marketing agent told them one thing, their <laughs> PR firm told them another thing, to have everything just on this simple two page pieces of paper. There's so much clarity and power that comes out of that just yeah. to distill all of those different ideas and lots of things you probably haven't asked yourself and talked about in years down to two pieces of paper. So it's right there for everybody to read. And I think it's really fascinating. You must see this when you're running your sort of vision building days as well as that sometimes the owners are a bit nervous that, you know, will the rest of the team kind of share what their 10 year target yes. is or, and yeah. I had a team the other day and it was just like the, I, I went, we went around the room. We always asked them to think individually what it might be and then bring it together and see what, what comes out of it. And they were all just absolutely kind of spot on in terms of what they wanted. And so the energy in that room, when they realized that they were really, really clear, but being able to articulate it because they, they all had that vision vision, that 10-year target in their brain, but nobody had actually written it down anywhere. And when you put it into writing and you actually, and I've got mine, looking at mine, it's, I've got a laminated version sitting over there. You know, when you actually have that and you can just look at it and kind of go, yeah, that's it. And you nail it. And even down to, you know, the core values, they had core values without a doubt. You know, we don't, we don't, we're not trying to do a tick pocket exercise to force you to have some core values. They already had them, but the fact that we could actually pull them out and then really clearly articulate them and then commit them to a piece of paper. So everybody knows what they are um, and I don't know there's just a magic that happens in that in that session there is there I've, I just had a session with with a client uh, earlier this week and 
the owner, just as you said, he was terribly worried that he was going to articulate this vision and that would that freak everybody out? Would they get nervous? <laughs> and, and one of the leadership team said, you know what? We've been begging you to tell us just where are we going? Yeah. Like, where, where are we going? And, and I always am reminded of, you know, entrepreneurs' brains are wired to be totally okay just winging it. Mm. Just figure it out as we go. We'll just, yep. I don't know, we'll change it. Entrepreneurs like to tell themselves, you know, we're the people who jump out of airplanes, build the parachute on the way down and all of that stuff. Yes. And But the people who work in the company are not entrepreneurial thinkers typically. And if they were, they'd leave and go start another company. <laughs> what they need is clarity, yeah. some certainty. Tell me where we're going. Tell me what my role is in getting us there. Show me my path, my career path within this company of where we're going. And then I'm going to get excited about that now. Mm. Now I see, okay, I can see why I'm going to stay here for 10 years because I want to be on this path. Before, I didn't know if you were going to change direction next year or next, next month. Week. <laughs> yeah. Right. You're going to go see a motivational speaker, come back to the office and say, Hey guys, we're going in a hold of me. We're, everybody's doing AI now. We're going to do <laughs> everybody. We're going to be an AI company. Before that, we have to be a software company. Before that, we have to be an innovative company. To just say, okay, I know, I don't know, we're going to take a lot of different turns and things may change, but I have a big idea of where we're going. And if you get energized by that, then you know why you're here mm -hmm. and you know how you fit in. And, yes. and that's, that sort of bridges the gap between the way an entrepreneur thinks and, when, and how their leadership team thinks and puts them really in sync like, like most companies do not ever get to. Yeah, I hadn't really thought about that. You're absolutely right. We do have a, a very unique way of um, yeah, being able to just cope with all that stuff. But for a lot of people, they want some stability, right? They want to know, well, where, where does this, um, how, how does this look in the future? Where do I fit in? I do, one of the things I've really loved about it, and I've been doing this for about three and a half years now, and I've done with a number of different companies, is the, the three-year picture is probably one of my favorite parts of that VTO. And I know it's something really, really simple, but, you know, every other um, training thing I've done, whether it be through your scaling up or your, or your, your ice house stuff that I did, you know, right. they had the big vision, they had the mission. But then they almost jump straight into the sort of the what you need to do. And I think there was too big a gap. And so people kind of go, so we've got this massive, big, hairy, audacious goal over here. And then this year we're working on this stuff down here. Like, How does that all fit together? And that three-year picture and painting a picture of what it looks like, it really does bring that really big, hairy, audacious goal, the 10-year target, right there down to the ground for people, I think. It does. And I, the, the interesting thing about it is that, that what's helpful, I think, about the 10-year piece is that it forces people – I think we can get all get stuck – in not being able to dream and think big enough mm. because we're just, we're, we're, if, if, you know, if I had, a, I was working with a company that had five locations and, and I said, well, what if in 10 years you had 30 because of they're so used to sort of this trudging along growth, they think that's insane. Yeah. Never stopping to think that look in 10 years, anything is possible. Mm. You could have 100 locations. You could have 200 locations. Anything is possible. So just that exercise of forcing you to think, I almost I always say to my coaching clients, like I'm giving you a magic wand. Yes. So you, you can't tell me that it's not possible. I just gave you a magic wand. And so first pushing your, your ability to think bigger mm -hmm. is inc massively important. But then just as you said, okay, that's where we're going to be in 10 years. So where do you need to be? in three years so that you're on the way there. And now you're moved into this, this, I actually wrote an article prior to my EOS days called the 36 month year, which was sort of trying to break this trend of these annual numbers that you're trying to hit, which really sort of only matter for public companies that have to report them. Mm -hmm. And to try to tell entrepreneurs, what if a year was 36 months? It's a bit of a construct that it's 12. So what if, what if a year was 36 months, then you wouldn't be rushing. You'd actually make some longer term decisions. You would mm -hmm. not be so crazed about what you do this year because you're trying to get somewhere in three years and, and just starting to think in terms of a 36 month year allows you to actually plant seeds in those first 12 months. It allows you to actually water them and get them growing in the second 12 months and to really make some leaps. In, in profitability and revenue that 
that this sort of 12 month focus doesn't allow. Yeah, that's a really good point. I haven't thought about that either. Um, and I think it just you just reminded me of a, of a client I was working with um, over in Melbourne who actually, when we were doing the 10-year target, um, he actually couldn't lift himself out of the how. So all that he kept thinking was, okay, so um, but we're only here now, so there's no way in the world we can be there. And you almost have to say, as, as you say, have a magic wand. Don't worry about the how, but just tell me what you really, really want. And if you tell me what you really, really want, there's nothing to stop you from getting there. And when we left the room, we finally sort of got the team to kind of agree that it was a much, much, much bigger target. It was a cleaning company. So they've got only, I think they only had about five or six um, cleaning franchises at the moment, but they really were driven by making a difference to the community and making a difference to the way the cleaning industry was was being operated. And so when we left that, I come with the actual magic number, but it was a massive number that they came up with. And then all of a sudden, once they kind of got there and kind of gone, okay, if we don't have to think about how we do it, but we just pick the number and we kind of go with it. Even before he left that room, he was starting to think about a different way of getting there. So rather than kind of going, hey, we just grow organically by just bringing on one or two new cleaners a month, it was like, actually, if I want to affect that number of people, I might need to go and join you know, the board of the International Cleaners Association, or I might need to, you know, so it just changes the way that you approach things if you can get that big picture thinking. Yeah, it's a push for that. I remember reading about this great exercise that Airbnb does which yeah. is they and I did this with a with a company just after I read about it which was they they say they take they take any process or anything within the company and say okay just because they're in the hospitality business they say where would this be on a are we a five star or a one star mm-hmm. in in terms of where we are and people say I don't know I, I think we're probably at a 3 for that and then they push the exercise and say well what would we have to do to be a 5 and then they keep going. What would we have to do to be a six and a seven and an eight? And they go all the way to 11. Oh, and why by 11? the time you get, to, I'm not sure. I, part of me thinks it's from that <laughs> movie Spinal Tap where they had the, oh. the amp that went to 11 because it was one more. Uh, but, okay. <laughs> but, but it pushes the, and by the time you get to 11, you have insane yeah, ideas. Mind you know, blowing. We're going <laughs> to carry every client by helicopter or whatever it is. But what they found happens is some of those ideas that come out in six and seven and eight are totally doable. Hmm. It just forced bigger thinking. And, and disruptive and it's, thinking. It's, it's this, yeah, it's the same idea of like, just be honest about yeah. where you are. And then starts to, well, what would you have to do to get to four, to five, to six, to seven? And yes, some of the ideas will be ridiculous at nine, 10, and 11. But there's <laughs> other ideas that are actually doable. It's just that your thinking is so bogged down in the how, as you said, or mm-hmm. in what you're used to, what you've grown accustomed to. We can't grow that way. We've never grown that way. We've never doubled our revenue. We've never done all those things. So why would it start now? And and if you can push people outside of the thinking that they've just grown accustomed to, magical things Magic can happen. Happens. Yeah. And I've heard you sort of talk about Dan Sullivan. I mean, the whole book that he wrote with, um, is it Thomas Hardy? The no, I don't say that. The who, not how. You know, so also when you start to think right. really, really big, it isn't actually about how you do it, but it's who can you work with to help you to achieve that. And that starts to change your thinking too. Uh, I think for a lot of businesses, it's like, well, actually, if you don't worry too much about the, the, um, yeah, the how you can just think about who you can work with to achieve that. Yeah. Or even as you mm-hmm. said, the minute that you got the cleaning company to just think bigger, yep. the ideas of how started coming. Yes. Yeah. But it but if he if he never got out of that initial how am I, I that's not possible. How am I gonna do that? How would I do that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those ideas never would have come to him. But once mm-hmm. he's, once you set that goal, and I, I know in EOS, they all say, you know, about the 10-year vision, you don't have to know how to get there. You just mm-hmm. have to first put the flag in the ground and say, this is where I want to be. Mm-hmm. And then we'll figure out how to get there. Yeah. But you, you have to put that, that, that idea out there so that your brain starts to say, hmm, let me start to think about how to get there. Yeah, as the subconscious to work on how, to, how you can yeah. do it. Yeah, yeah. As opposed <laughs> to just like, how do I get to next month? How do I get to next quarter? How do I get to next year? And I think Gino, Gino Wigton talks about the fact that, you know, we always underestimate what we can achieve in 10 years, but we overestimate what we can achieve in the short term. So it's really important that 10-year thinking really keeps you focused on where you're going. Okay, uh, VTO, definitely amazing tool. I think you and I can agree <laughs> on that. And it's really funny because um, 
I, I did like some of the old fashionedness of EOS, if I can say that, in terms of, you know, the fact that we actually, when we work together in a session, we write things down. I, even though I use some software to keep track of my EOS stuff, I actually print out and laminate my EOS VTO every quarter. And I have four copies of it. I have one in my office, I have one in my session room, I have one in my car, and I have one at my home. And I, I literally, you know, I, I refer back to it all the time. I'm, I'm thinking about, does this make the, the needle go f- Far, um, you know, does it move the needle? Does it make the boat go faster? And if it does, great. If it doesn't, I can then start to say no to things. And I think particularly if you're a person who struggles to say no to things, having that clarity of vision is like, mm, yeah, you know what? No, thanks. This isn't for me. <laughs> and and guardrails, right? The, yeah. the, it, it, it's helpful to be able to have that filter to say no to things. But yeah. Yep. Is it on here? Will it help me get to here? Then it's a it makes it an easier yes or no because yes. there there is no shortage of opportunities coming at an entrepreneur. There's no mm-hmm. shortage of opportunities. They all sort of look good. We might as well try them all. Right? It's the <laughs> idea of fewer better, but it it's it's it gives you this filtering tool that it makes it a very a much faster yes or no. Mm-hmm. Will this get us to ten thousand people? Will it get us to to serving a hundred thousand people or whatever our our mission is? Yes or no? Yeah. Or is it just another bright, shiny object that's taking me away from what I should be <laughs> doing? Is, exactly, <laughs> as as visionaries, shiny, you know, we, we love those things. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm really is guilty the, is of it. It's a real yeah. thing. <laughs> It really is, yeah. Okay, great. Hey, um, I can see that you know you're obviously really passionate about healthy business. What are, what's your ideal kind of business that you work with? What do you love? What's your um, what's your niche, if you like, in terms of people you like to work with? I, I love a privately owned business. I, I've never been one for big corporates. I mm-hmm. like a business that is that has that has hit this ceiling. That is at this point, they've probably been at that point for a couple of years where the entrepreneur just goes home at night thinking. If only, if only, if only, why, why is this year feel like last year and the year before and the year before? There is that quiet. They dare not say it out loud. They only say it to them. It's what's keeping them up at night that they know deep in their soul that their business could and should be more. And mm-hmm. they want to feel that. They, they want to make more impact. They want to get people. They want to have um, a business that makes them proud. and something is stopping them. And so if they, if they can just raise their hand and say, I, I don't want to do this on my own. My, my pride is stopping me from asking for help mm-hmm. to get to where I want to go. Then anything is possible. The minute they put their hand up and say, I don't have all the answers. Uh, and it's not that I know anything so incredible, but I, as I, the, one of the opening lines in my first book 15 years ago now was, it's hard to read the label from inside the bottle. <laughs> and so half of what I'm doing is I'm not emotionally connected to it. So if I love working with a business owner who's decided they want more, they don't want to feel this way anymore. They want to make a bigger impact in the world. And they, they want somebody who is willing to lock elbows with them and charge up the hill. Yeah. Love, love it. Okay, so three top tips, Sam. What would you? What are your? What are you going to share with the listeners around either your journey as an entrepreneur yourself, or um, things you've learned on your way, or even an EOS tool that you like? I don't mind. <laughs> well, we we hit VTO. So some of the other yep. things that I find valuable is one is a strategic coach tool, which is which is sort of a magic four quadrants that that they teach you in strategic coach, which is. Is, which is really trying to, to focus in on your unique ability and to spend mm-hmm. more time in unique ability. And the trick of it is to, to make this incredible brain dump of everything you do in a day or a week, all the way up to you know putting stamps on things or envelopes or whatever it is you're doing. And then to look at that list and turn it into things that you hate doing, that you're okay at doing. Then there's this section that is things that you're good at, but you actually don't like. Mm-hmm. And the trick of it is that that we wind up spending all of our time in that quadrant. And we don't get to this this unique ability, which is the thing that we were born to do, that we could do all day long and never get tired. In fact, our energy goes up. And identifying that and then going through a process over time of of automating or delegating everything else. Not overnight, but getting there. And I find that, that a lot of the entrepreneurs that I meet are really their business, they've been pulled down by the gravity of their business because it grew 
And so they're spending a lot less time in their unique ability, which is what allowed the business to get off the ground in the first place. First place. But yeah. now they're spending time on HR and people problems and negotiating with a landlord and a new lease and every other thing, improving invoices and <laughs> looking at checks and you name it. Yep. And they're not sure why they're feeling so down, but it's because they're no longer spending time in the in the, the areas where they create the most value that come that is their gift, that is yeah. their craft. And and it's an exercise that I, I like to use to get them there. Mm-hmm. What is it so, called? Instrat- it's still an elevator in, in um, EOS, but it, is, it does but come the, from the, the Dan Sullivan same, tool, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, I think, well, there's, there's a lot of crossover with Strategic Coach to, yes. to, to <laughs> EOS in, in all the best ways. But it's, it's just this idea of just reconnecting to, to the activities that you love because you're innately good at them. doesn't mean yeah. that everybody is, but... You know, I had I had a client recently who just felt guilty about just he just wanted to be out talking to clients and talking to potential clients, but he felt terribly guilty that his his job was supposed to be running the business, and so was that unfair? And yet, the business existed because he was so good at talking to clients, and he wasn't (laughs) doing it enough, and so it it was it was a powerful conversation to be able to say. You should be doing that. And there are people who would hate doing that, but love the day-to-day of running the company and the HR problems and the people problems and all of that kind of stuff. And identifying that, right, the same way that there is a visionary role in in EOS and an integrator role, and they're not great to be the same person, no. is that there, yeah, are people that, that there are people that love very different things. Mm-hmm. And identifying that so that you are liberated. I, you know, I, one of the biggest things that EOS does, I think, is it solves the problem that everybody comes to, which is how do I work on my business instead of in it? Mm-hmm. And, and EOS is a really powerful process for liberating the entrepreneur and the visionary to get back to working on their business again, which yeah. is how they grew it in the first place. That's exactly right. Yeah, perfect. Okay. That's, so that's the first tip then. What are the other two? <laughs> Next one is is it's a little bit uh, from uh, Mike Miklowitz's book Profit First. I'm, oh, yeah. I'm a big fan of the Profit First formula, which is revenue minus the profit is, equals the expenses that you have to spend, mm. instead of revenue minus expenses equals profit. And I think it's particularly powerful because people get in a real rut of not sort of making leaps in profit, which just gives a tremendous amount of freedom to the business and the entrepreneur, and I often tell people it's revenue minus the profit you dream to make. And then it it creates incredible um, clarity around your expenses. I think as as the tech industry has learned over the last year or so, you can really get out of control with your expenses when you grow. Uh, I work with a company a year or two ago that was growing, was doubling almost every year and made the exact same amount of profit because Mm -hmm. they were focused on revenue, not the bottom line. Yeah. And and I always say to people, revenue is is for your ego, but profit will give you the business that you want. So that profit first formula is is a powerful way to start to um, get some religion about expenses. I was going to say, start to examine what's really working, what's not. Yeah, <laughs> perfect. Um, I actually, I, it's funny because I always thought profit first was really for smaller businesses, but it's it's the philosophy applies to any size business. Yes, it's that. And in fact, that, sometimes that when you little flip. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, perfect. Right. Okay, last, last but not least. <laughs> last but not least is is um, is this idea that I, I've touched on a little bit, but I, you know, and I actually wrote a long street about it. But I was trying to understand why business owners don't ask for help. Mm-hmm. I, I would I had enough experiences where people who knew me, who knew what I do, didn't come to me and ask for help, and then would would reach out to me when they had thirty or sixty days worth of cash left in the bank. Right. And and it really came down to I, I don't know if we're, we can curse on this uh, yes, podcast. Of or not. Yeah, I'm so, British. So, Hope you like. So, <laughs> <laughs> so so I wound up writing this long rant, which is titled "Fuck Your Pride," which was <laughs> that that pride is is what is is crushing your business, and 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 the subtitle was "Build a Business That Makes You Proud," and mm-hmm. I, it actually lives at the manifesto around this, and and. Because that was my when I had my freight business, I didn't ask for help for a couple of years, yeah. And and only when I asked for help and I met somebody that became sort of a mentor to me, did things start to turn around. Because I was stuck inside the bottle, inside the hurricane, mm-hmm. and and just 
getting outside of that pride uh, and and realizing that 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 pride is 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 what is holding you back to have a business that makes you proud. Mm. I also have a little thing that I often talk about. It's about flipping this on its head as well. It's like I always say, if I asked you to help me, how does that make you feel? And most people go, I'd feel great about helping you. So it's like you're actually ripping people off if you're not allowing them to help you because you're taking away that ability for them to feel really good. So please ask for some help so you can make somebody else feel good. <laughs> yes, but you're absolutely there, right. there's this, there's this you know, Superman thing about, about being yeah. an entrepreneur that's just that's, – that's broken, that, that asking for help is weakness. Mm. That, yeah. That, it's a failure. That, right. I mean, and I, and I succumb to the same thing. I thought if I, everybody thinks that I'm this entrepreneur, I'm 31 years old, I'm running this huge business. If yeah. I ask for help, who am I? Mean, I they, I'll let them all down or I'm going to break the bubble. But, but the truth, it was, it was the total opposite that, that I was, I was in my own way and, if I asked for help, it would still be my business. It would still be me that's doing it because I'm the one that asked for help. I'm the one that found somebody to help us get to where we needed to be. And I think sometimes, you know, I think you, you and I have probably both been there, you know, when you are so bogged down, when things aren't going well and you're trying to turn things around, you know, it's not easy to actually lift yourself out of the day to day, the firefighting, the stuff that's going on to really take a good hard look. Yeah, and absolutely. I think that asking for help, people can just, it's so much, I know as an EO, it's so much easier being on the outside and being able to ask those questions than it is being on the inside. And even to the point where just recently I've made the decision in our own business, we're going to get an EOS implementer in to actually facilitate our EOS quarterlies because I've been mm. doing it myself and I think I do an okay job but I'm I'm too close I actually need somebody to to be outside and ask those difficult questions and yeah. and in in a kind way but you know for the for the greater good not just because they want to put the bear yeah I, I always think perspective I think that, that I'm ultimately what I'm offering is my you know, my experience through all kinds of good and bad stuff but yep. I'm offering perspective empathy and kind candor. Mm, yes. And and if I can do those three things then then good things happen. Yeah, no, that's cool. Hey, look, um, again, I, I love my podcast. You know, I think this is my um, things I love and I'm great. At, I hope I really enjoy doing like a talk all day. Uh, but we do have to kind of call it quits because we have a certain limited time for a podcast. Um, Howard, I I love what you're doing. I love the books that you've written. I love your philosophies. I'm sure there are other people out there who are listening who, who say, yes, I wouldn't mind having a chat to this guy either. How would they get in contact with you? Where do they get the books from? Give us a little bit of information about yourself. Sure. Uh, and thank you for that. Uh, it, you can, it's very easy. You can go to Howard Mann with two N's, uh, mm -hmm. dot com. And there's a newsletter there. If you sign up for the newsletter, you get my first book for free as a PDF. Nice. Um, the other book is there. It's available on Amazon and Kindle and paperback and hardcover. Um, there's a podcast that I'm working on that I did, did one last year. That's just me solo, but I'm working on another one, but, uh, nice. there's a button right there to, you know, my, my, uh, whether I work with somebody or not as a client, I, I love to be in conversations with business owners who, who want to have a, a real and candid and open conversation because they're, they, they want their business to be more. So, uh, you know, there's a button there to just set up a consult with me and it's not a sales pitch. It's just, let's have a really long, deep conversation and see if we can, we can get somewhere. Yeah, that's great. Hey, look, um, I'm sure that uh, well, I would recommend anybody who's thinking about doing that should do that because I know that we also share the same philosophy about it. it really is help first. We're not, we never do any, we never do any selling as such. It's about actually, um, let's just have a conversation. Let's see if I can help in some way. Yeah, it's an amazing core value of EOS, the Health First, and it's been true throughout my journey with them, and it, it's, it makes a huge difference. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, Howard, hey, thank you so much for your time. Um, please go back and enjoy the rest of your Friday evening, afternoon, whatever it is. Is it, is it, is it, is it evening over there in New York <laughs> it is, City? Right, it is uh, almost It's just past 9.30 in the evening here on oh, a Friday wow. night. Okay, well, you go enjoy the rest of your Friday evening. Lovely to talk to you. Um, thank you for having you me. It's soon. been a pleasure. Absolute pleasure. Thank you. Thanks.